Once regarded as the best of Vancouver Island ski resorts, the storied legacy of Forbidden Plateau dates all the way back to 1946. Though today, the mountain is devoid of any infrastructure, a few decades ago, it was the site of a busy ski resort. In this video, we'll embark on a comprehensive journey, tracing the complete evolution of Forbidden Plateau from its humble beginnings to its rise, subsequent decline, and ultimate closure. So, without further delay, let's dive into this video. The history of skiing on Forbidden Plateau dates all the way back to the 1930s. After the Camo District Mountaineering Club was formed in 1928, skiing became prevalent within the club during the winter. In 1934, the first ski lodge in the mountain was constructed, further cementing the location as a winter sports site. Much of Forbidden Plateau was logged in the early 1930s, making ideal skiing conditions down the clear-cut mountain. In 1937, a group of skiers officially formed the Forbidden Plateau Ski Club. This ski club wouldn't just stay on the mountainside of Forbidden Plateau, often hiking up mountains such as Mount Albert Edward or other peaks. In 1946, the first lift at Forbidden Plateau was constructed, a humble rope tow. The Camo District Mountaineering Club was the main proponent of this lift, providing all the funding and manpower to build it. With this addition, Forbidden Plateau started to boom in popularity, expanding the club's lodge and opening a ski school. The only hindrance was the maintenance of the access road. The mountain land that Forbidden Plateau was located on belonged to the Scott Paper Company. In 1961, the ski club asked the paper company for a purchase or a lease agreement regarding the land that the ski run sat on. The paper company unexpectedly denied the request, instead revoking all public access to the land. This resulted in a boycott of all Scott Paper products, including a Canadian affiliate brand of Scott Paper who suffered financial losses from the boycott. A month later, Scott Paper backed down on its position eventually agreeing to do a land swap with the provincial government. The government designated 240 acres of mountain land to be Wood Mountain Ski Park and designated it Class C. This meant that the land would be used to provide recreation for the community and would be managed by a local board. 1964 was a busy year for the mountain. First, the government finally extended the access road to the base of the rope toes and built a parking lot. Second, the mountain installed a GMT Mueller T-Bar costing $32,000. This T-Bar serves the lower slopes, officially opening to the public in 1965. Finally, the ski club formed a new corporation titled Mount Becker Ski Development Society, who managed all operations at Forbidden Plateau. Forbidden Plateau exploded with popularity through the late 1960s. For example, in 1965, the mountain recorded 3,826 skier visits. In 1966, this number had increased to almost 8,000. After this good year, the mountain installed its second Mueller T-Bar, opening the entire mountain face up to skiing. Additionally, night skiing was proposed and the ski resort officially changed names from Wood Mountain Ski Park to Forbidden Plateau. While the society had taken a lot of debt to finance the upgrades, they were still dreaming big. By 1968, a chairlift had been planned up the main face as well as an additional T-Bar up an entirely new peak. Unfortunately, a poor winter in 1967 caused the society to have to borrow $5,000 in order to stay afloat. It was also around this time that an unexpected annual tax bill was served to the ski community. The society elected not to pay it year after year, arguing that they were a not-for-profit organization and thus should not have to pay tax. In 1971, a new day lodge was constructed, indirectly replacing the original building. One year later, a state-of-the-art Mueller double chairlift of the frontside was constructed. This lift was a game changer for the resort and helped boost visitation numbers. However, around this time, the provincial government began garnishing the ski resort's bank account in regards to the unpaid taxes the society owed. A second chairlift and another T-bar up to the summer were on the resort's master plan. The second chairlift idea was scrapped due to rising costs, however, a third Mueller T-bar was indeed constructed in 1975. In 1976, the provincial government proposed a private ski development on Coronation Mountain. The island's three existing ski resorts fiercely banded against this proposal, arguing that the government should be investing further in the already developed resorts. Ultimately, the ski resort development on Coronation Mountain went nowhere. However, Forbidden did have to deal with the brand new development of Mount Washington Ski Resort in 1979. Though initially, Forbidden Plateau wasn't too concerned with the competition, things were about to get rough. 
While the mountain had proposed an ambitious master development plan, including several more lifts, runs, and general improvements, the 1980-1981 ski season was a complete disaster. In 1980, the province promised the resort to give them a $142,000 grant from the lottery fund. Based on this promise, the ski area undertook a huge expansion of the day lodge. Ultimately, the government never gave forbidden the grant money, leaving the ski area in a financial bind. Along with the lodge debt, the ski resort was left owing over $160,000 to small businesses all over the valley, as well as carrying an accumulated debt of $900,000. To try and raise cash, in 1981, Forbidden introduced a 10-year ski pass, costing $500. While this pass deal indeed surpassed expectations, the winters of 1981-82 and 1982-83 brought very little snow for Forbidden Plateau, only allowing for limited winter operations. Additionally, with Mount Washington ski resort located at a higher elevation and with better lifts and more runs, it was clear that many skiers were drawn there over Forbidden Plateau. In 1984, the Mount Becker ski development finally went bankrupt after the Federal Business Development Bank called in a loan of $208,000. Unable to pay any of it, the society shuttered Forbidden Plateau. Coincidentally, this was the same year that Green Mountain permanently closed. Later that summer, a group of local Nanaimo shareholders formed Forbidden Plateau Recreation Limited and scrapped together $300,000 to purchase all assets from the bankruptcy court. By 1987, the group had reopened the mountain finally operating debt-free. Forbidden Plateau operated through the 1990s, though it became a very bare-bones operation. Though there were some improvements, such as night skiing installed in 1998, Forbidden Plateau overall struggled. One of the biggest challenges the resort faced was the close proximity to the better capitalized Mount Washington, which boasted better snow, more runs, and overall better equipment. Forbidden Plateau began the search for an investor who would take control of the resort while doing necessary upgrades to compete with Mount Washington. On February 27, 1999, part of the ski lodge roof above the cafeteria collapsed under heavy snowfall. Thankfully, as it happened in the evening, no one was injured and the remaining buildings were relatively undamaged. The building was not insured and the damages were estimated to be around $250,000. Regardless, Forbidden Plateau managed to reopen a week later and that summer hosted a fundraising concert to repair the lodge. This concert was a success and the lodge roof was repaired. Sadly, in September of 1999, Robert Kirk, the president of Forbidden Plateau, announced that the mountain would not reopen. Kirk claimed that the last few winters for Forbidden Plateau had been a disaster and that he was subsidizing operations out of his own pocket. Kirk claimed that all Forbidden needed was an outside investor who would upgrade the resort. Kirk claimed here that Forbidden was not dead, but merely mothballed. In February of 2002, a suspicious fire completely destroyed the ski lodge. Unfortunately, in the three years leading up to the fire, the lodge had become a target to vandals who would frequently force their way into the building. While Kirk and his group had hoped for an investor to come in, the loss of the lodge was the nail in the coffin. In 2004, the Ski Hill's 20-year lease with the provincial government expired, marking the final end of Forbidden Plateau. Over the next decade, the remaining buildings, equipment, and lifts would continue to deteriorate further and further. Finally, in 2018, everything was finally removed from the mountain, including the chairlift and all remaining structures. Only the top bull wheel of the chairlift was left to commemorate the ski resort. Now, let's discuss how Forbidden Plateau as a mountain skied. From its highest point to the mountain's lowest elevation, Forbidden Plateau had a 327 meter vertical drop. The highest point was at the top of the green T-bar, which went a little higher than the chairlift did. The chairlift itself was a center pole GMD Mueller double and gained around 300 meters of elevation. At 1.36 kilometers in length, it was fairly long for a double and probably would have had a significant ride time. From the top of the chairlift, there were many options that greeted the skier. The logging road green run was Forbidden's only top to bottom green. Coming in at almost three kilometers in length, this run is quite long and it gives access to quite a few other runs. There are two or three short blues coming off the top of the chair. These runs wouldn't have been too long or challenging, but they would have provided some variety. The upper Boston blue run was the other major top to bottom run, though it wasn't as long as the logging road run. Upper Boston gave way to two other black runs. The bone shaker black run looks like it was the steepest on the mountain. 
This run was most likely moguled and started on the logging road before ending near the bottom of the red T-bar. Forbidden Plateau was a great intermediate mountain with the majority of terrain falling in this category. Perhaps the most interesting intermediate run was Kandahar, which ran the entire vertical of Forbidden from the top of the green T-bar to the bottom. Speaking of which, let's talk about the green T-bar. This lift acts as the Lookout Green and Kandahar, but looks like it was a really unique upper mountain terrain pod. I can imagine that many families spent many runs on Lookout, and can guess that this pod was fairly popular. It's worth noting that Forbidden had the blue T-bar near the base of the resort. This lift dated back to Forbidden's early days, and over time became a secondary lift. As the blue run that it serves is called Slalom, I can imagine that this lift became a useful race training center. Finally, the red T-bar serviced much of the same terrain as the double did. This T-bar was removed in the 1990s to free up more skiing space on the mountain. Overall, Forbidden Plateau looks like a great family mountain that had a little bit for everyone. It's sad that it's gone now as it would have been enjoyable to ski these trails. Forbidden Plateau had a lot of potential. Unfortunately, the resort simply could not compete with the bigger Mount Washington and eventually faded out. I do wonder how long the ski area would have lasted had it not closed in 1999. Perhaps if the right investor was found, Forbidden Plateau would still operate as a downhill ski resort. Ultimately though, we'll never know. Thanks for watching this video! If you enjoyed it, please consider subscribing to my channel. And until next time, this is Skier72.